So uh, Korchuk is learning very quickly, and because he has this child within him, he is learning how to actually deal with children, and because of it, children see the same person in him. They don't see an adult in him. They see an equal, which is the biggest compliment the child can pay you. That is, oh, you are like us. That's a real compliment. Very few people get it. But when you get it, they, it's not like you went down, you went up. Because then you can embrace this whole world of childhood, all of them. You can treat them the way you can, uh, they deserve. There's an incredible book which Korchuk wrote much later in life. It's called When I'm Little Again. It's kind of a fairy tale. And when I'm little again is like overnight a teacher wakes up and he is a school child in the same school where he is teaching. And his mother is uh, cooking breakfast for him and saying, you will be late for school. And he goes to the same school, but as a school child. Now, imagine this. You are tall. You are an adult. You are a teacher. You have all the authority in your hands. And all of a sudden, you are here. You are lower physically, you are lower in the position, you are there to sit and listen to and comply with the rules. If you ever think and put yourself in this position for at least an hour, you would understand how children feel. And when children look at you like bored and you are a teacher, that's a sign, right? That's a sign, something you are doing wrong. It's not the sign to punish. I had a teacher at school, you know, in Soviet schools, the discipline was strict. I had a teacher of physics. Whenever a child, we had a bright kid, really bright in physics, whenever he would raise his hand to ask a question, she would say, Victor, that corner, there, an hour. I realized long after she never knew answers. So he was a huge threat to her intellectual world. So instead of hearing his question or letting him speak, the corner. He learned very quickly that he shouldn't even raise his hand. So children learn. But when you put yourself in the shoes of a child and you think of why it's so important to do it. I was once in Birmingham in the UK observing an elementary school. You know what struck me most? When the teacher at ele elementary school was coming up to every desk, she was bending on her knees and her eyes were at the level of the eyes of the children. Just think of this, that's a very simple thing, but I, I can't bend now. <laughs> so if you bend and your eyes are at the same level, it's a totally different way of approaching a child. He or she doesn't feel like you are intimidating, you are a power above, you are equal. And if you know something more or a little less, there's no threat. And uh, if you ever taught at any place, you would know children are quite often, more often than not, are more knowledgeable than adults in a certain field. And the best way to do, uh, to connect with the child is to let the child teach you something which you don't know, and you sincerely accept this new knowledge. That's a trick which adults could play, but it works. When the child is put in the position he or she knows something, it's, it's a totally different world. Then the teacher is not like a huge power brought to evaluate your knowledge 
or your no knowledge. It's actually the world which, which is equal, which is okay. I know this, he knows that. Korchuk learned this and uh, being with the children who were sick, who were from very humble beginnings, he realized these are the children who needed him most. And he felt more and more during his first formative years as an adult, as a professional, that that is the field he wanted to actually pursue. And he started with being a tutor in summer camps. So he felt like he brought a, a ball for volleyball, he brought a couple of books, he went to the summer camp, and he thought life would be rosy, you know. And all of a sudden, all these kids out of the school, fresh air, and they're so not disciplined what to do with them. He was terrified. He thought he knew nothing of the kind. So his first experience with the children actually being outside was very unruly and very difficult for him. He realized, frankly, it's, it's not what he expected. And then he was learning. And he was learning really hard. And uh, for the next few years, uh, the dilemma within him, emotional and intellectual, was what to choose, medicine, or being an educator, and he finally made a decision. And he wrote for a long time afterwards, and he, and he felt this way, that he was betraying medicine and the children, sick children, but he made his choice. And starting from 1912, he became a director of Dom Siro. Dom, the word dom is the house. Uh, sirata, in the plural, sirot means orphans. So this is the orphan's home. This is the house for children who didn't have parents, and those were Jewish children. Uh, the street in which uh, the house was built is called Krahmalna Street. Jerry, does it have any meaning, Krahmalna? No, yeah. not really? No. No? Um, so, and it was in a very good location in Warsaw, and the building itself was exceptionally good because it was actually built by the architect, and Korczyk was very much involved in deciding how and what should be in the building. So it's not like bringing children into something which exists. He actually thought of how the building for children should be created to become most comfortable, most convenient for them. Just going, uh, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, first thing that the, the group of people was, was supporting it was a big building, it's yeah, a huge yeah. project, and of course there was a question of finances. Yeah. But it was his dear friend, the pediatrician, yeah. Uh, whose name, uh, whose name we kind of know from uh, Jane, yeah. yeah? Uh, Dr. Elias Berg. Uh, yeah. Dr. Elias Berg and also his wife were absolutely instrumental yeah. in uh, supporting financially, not just financially, this project. And what's extraordinary is that the granddaughter of Dr. Elias Berg is today with us. It's Jane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Jane was very gracious to send that water, which I put in, into here. So, um, yeah, there were several people, and Dr. Ellisberg was one of very influential and very uh, really generous in his donations. So, um, going then further in history, this house one then moved in 1940 and then finally moved into the building which was within the uh, Warsaw Ghetto. So there are a few photos of the building itself. As you see, there's a huge dining room like this common room where everyone could be and enjoy and have uh, uh, meals and also have meetings together. Uh, that is the way it was built. And 
I wouldn't be wrong if I say it was probably exceptional at the time, right? Like maybe the only one in the world which existed this way. Children had this white sheets, beautiful beds, and if you think of this now, of course it looks like so many kids in the same room. I can t so this is, this is again something different. Kids were very much involved in running and helping, so they were peeling potatoes, as you see. The boys in the kitchen, the girls outside in good weather. So the kids were very much involved, and again, if you have uh, smaller, younger siblings, or if you remember yourself, when a girl or a boy is growing and the mother is doing something in the kitchen, kids love helping, right? They would make a mess of it, but they love helping, say, oh, can I bake a cake? Can I do this? Can I do that? And mothers usually say, no, 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 no. Go play. And then years later, we're surprised they don't want to help us at home because they were never allowed to do it. So Korchuk understood that, and, and also it was a necessity, of course. He couldn't hire many people, so they were very much involved in different activities about the, uh, the uh, house. So I want you to read this where he's writing in this ghetto uh, diary, he's talking about being a Jew and being a Pole. And he says, that's exactly, frankly, how I felt living in the Soviet Russia. We are from one land. We have suffered, we live together under the sun, the same earth. Our journey has been a long one. Let us work together. Let us support, comfort each other. Let us grow and learn together. And unfortunately, to this day, we didn't learn this very simple lesson. We all are constructed of bones and flesh and the same red blood. And all our distinct, distinguished features they come much later in life. We're first born as human beings. If we could remember that, if we can start teaching like that, maybe the next generation would have a happier life. So here I want you to see the photo. And again, Jane, thank you for sending it out. Uh, this is um, Isaac and Stella. Ellisberg, and uh, they, they were ones of real big donors. And in this picture, in the group picture, if you see the person with the mustache, that is Isaac Ellisberg as well, with the children. So um, I wanted to show you, going back to history, what happened during the World War I. So before World War I, as I said, Poland was part of Russia. And other parts of Poland were under Austria or under Germany. During the First World War, all three suffered a lot, Germany, Russia, and Austria. And as one of the results, as one of the consequences, which was very positive for Poland, Finally, Poland, as an independent state, was reborn in 1918. So this red, which shows Gdansk, Poznan, Warsaw, you see that in the center. That is actually Poland as an independent country. Finally, after over a century ago. So now... Korczyk is in the new country, which was independent. But before that, many things happened in his life. He went through a number of wars because he was a doctor. And as a medical professional, he had to be in the army. And what is really incredible, to remain sane, to remain intact in his mentality and his emotions, right during the war 
actually in the war, he started writing one of his most incredible books, that is, How to Love a Child. If you think of this, if you imagine the situation, there are bombs, you hear this, you can be killed like this very moment, and you are writing the title of the book, How to Love a Child. Pretty amazing, right? But I guess when you are in the war zone and you feel like tomorrow could be your last day, you are trying to say something most important. You are trying to put on paper something which would stay with the next generation, something you actually want to leave after you are gone. How to love a child. If you think of the title, and if you're a parent or a teacher, it might sound kind of crazy. What does it mean, how to love a child? Of course I love my children. Of course I, ki I kind of love my students. And I kind of know how to do it. But Korczyk literally puts it into a different perspective, into a different hemisphere, if you wish. Korczyk is talking about how to really love a child, meaning how to respect the child. When you quarrel with your spouse or boyfriend, if you have one, or a girlfriend, at times the question comes, do you respect me? But the first one, do you love me at all? Do you respect my opinion? So Korczyk starts with children. Do you love them? Do you respect them? And if you do, do you consider their opinions? Or respect and love come by itself and their opinions come separately because they are younger, they are smaller, and why should I really bother? Have you ever thought of that? Who would say I don't love my child? Hardly anyone. Who would say I really listen to my child and do what the child prompts me? That's a very different story. Because every parent usually feels like, okay, I know better. But if you go deeper into this, none of us was really professionally trained to be a parent. Right? We're trained to be doctors, nurses, legal officers, educators, teachers. We were never really trained to be parents. Why? Because it feels like it's a biologically inherited. You give birth to a child, and then all of a sudden, overnight, you know how to do it. And you don't, right? You don't. And each day, your child surprises you more times, more often than not. Did anyone train us to really listen to our child? No, because it feels like we're parents. Yeah, we're supposed to know it. No one will bring you into the classroom and would say, teach. No, you need to have four years of education. You need a certificate of a teacher. And there's a huge group of people who would test you before you are brought into the school building, right? But here you are with the baby. You're a parent. Welcome to the world of parenthood. How are we parenting our children? By mistakes we make daily. And then we learn. And Korczyk tries to predict these mistakes, but not from the point of view of an educator or trainer or coach who actually trains us how to do it, but from the point of view of a child. He is a real child advocate who tells us, you dummy, you didn't do it right because I, as a child, would do it this way. And this, this is an incredible role he plays for us through his experience, through what he did, and of course, mostly through his writings. He shows how to love a child, and that's real. That's real training, and that's very unique. So let's look here. We're going back to Poland. 
1920s is kind of rebirth of many things. Joseph Pilsudski is the one who is the head of Poland at the time, and he is the one who says Poland is for everyone for Jews, for Poles, for every other ethnicity living here, citizenship for all. This is the time when the Jewish intelligence is thriving, the Polish intelligence is thriving. This is the country where is the renaissance, if you wish, how do you pronounce French? Renaissance, yeah? Uh, Renaissance, no, I mean in French. Renaissance. Renaissance. Okay. Uh, so uh, that, is, that is this period in Poland. And in fact, uh, what Korczuk wrote at the time is really, really exemplary. But how can you have a person like this who is so much ahead of his time for long? No. And, uh, uh, and very, very shortly in, in history, there came another person. But I want to bring you to this particular period in his life when he was a prolific writer and he did a number of things and we will hear from different presenters because of it I'm doing it so quickly because we will have presenters who would talk about these topics. So King Matt the First, that's one of the best children's books I ever read, seriously. I strongly recommend. This is about a child who became the king, what happened to him as a ruler of the country, how much he didn't know. He finally ends up almost murdered. Uh, then he is sent to a deserted island, and that's the second part of the book, which is called King Matt on a Deserted Island. So I'm not going into telling you the story, but I would strongly recommend to read it. It's very easy reading. And um, it gives you a perspective of a child being a ruler. Another thing which happened with Korczuk, he was a journalist. He wrote a lot. And then he realized, why only me or any adult? Let's give the word to children. And finally, and very quickly, he started this first in the world children's newspaper, Little Review, where all the journalists were children. And again, the perspective of children is pretty incredible. Have you ever been in the classroom where the teacher would say, today you are teachers, I'm just sitting in the back? Have you ever been in these situations? And, and you would think there will be a mess. Now, in fact, children are much more strict than their current teacher. And they try to rule, to discipline, to have everything orderly. Did you ever experience this? So you would know what I mean, right? So when you give children the ability, the possibility, the space to work like a responsible person, they take this responsibility very seriously. This is what was happening with this little review. It became a very popular newspaper, the books and little review. So he tried to kind of split his life. And I'm sure those of you who managed to, to be multitask people and to split your lives into several spheres, have you ever felt like you are kind of betraying one of them or two of them and doing great in another one, but you would rather do something better in another one and one more and one more, but it's never like equal. Like, can you take yourself as a personality and split it into equal parts or your brain or your emotions? You give yourself fully to something, right? So uh, that was what was happening with Korczuk. His heart was stolen by children. So it was forever given to children. Everything else he was doing was done great, but children were his priority. There was another great educator, absolutely not known in the Western world. He lived in Ukraine. His name was Vasily Suhamlinsky. 
And if you are interested, I can give you references in English. So he was born in 1918, and he was a principal of a village school, and he was absolutely great. But what I want to mention, he wrote a book, many books, one of them especially, and it is translated into English. You can check on Amazon. It's entitled, My Heart I Give to Children. I was thinking this is a great metaphor for courtship because that's exactly what he did. He gave his heart to children. In Suhamlinsky's uh, life, he was wounded during the Second World War, and one of the bullets was so close to the heart that when they did a surgery on him, they couldn't take it out without actually ruining him. So he had literally part of the bullet next to his heart. And when finally it started moving, he was 52 years old, he died. And he literally died in the school building. So that was September 1st, that was the first day of school, and uh, he lost his consciousness. They got him to the hospital, next day he died. But before that, he wrote one of those incredible books my heart I give to children. Korchuk gave his heart to children the same physical way. He died with them in guest chambers. But as I said before, to me, this is not heroism. What he was doing all his life was heroic. Would you agree? Because, as we said, you die with your child, of course. How can you let the child go? But when you live with them all your life, you go through everything with them, that is heroism. What I didn't mention before, when Korcha came from the war, he got sick with typhus. And typhus was a big thing at the time. And he was very sick at the time he was visiting with his mother. And his mother, being a mother, insisted that he would stay at home and she would take care of him. And what happened, as it would happen, she contracted typhus from him. And while he survived, she did not. But being a mother, her last words and her last wish was, take me through the back door for him not to see that I am gone. As a mother would, right? Even dying, thinking about her child. So he, after he got recovered and he learned about what happened to his mother, he felt like that's exactly what he did. He killed his mother. And he was about to commit a suicide. He felt like, what did I do? That's my mother, and she died because of me, so I go next. He didn't do it. He, in fact, there's, there's a historic fact. He wrote to his sister saying, let's commit a suicide together. Our mother is gone, right? Fortunately for the children and for the humanity, he did not do it. He stayed. But that was one of the episodes which I wanted to share with you that I want you to understand he was real. He was a human being. He was not some, you know, exemplary, 100% wonderful person. He had his ups and downs as anyone. And especially in the last years of the orphanage when he was in the Warsaw Ghetto, he was so much in despair. He would drink vodka. He would stay at night thinking, getting himself drunk, thinking how to feed the children. Because when your children are starving and you don't know how to bring a potato to them, you would do anything. He was writing and doing actually, like literally on his knees begging for food for the children. And there's no, you know, 
no humility in that, like being on your knees. That's actually a great act of showing that you're really human. You understand that that's children. They can provide for themselves. I have to do it as an adult. So later on in the Polish culture in 1930s, this gentleman who never had a real big political position, Dwomsky is his last name, but he was a huge nationalist. And his idea of Poland was Poland for Poles. Have you heard of things like this? Germany for Germans, Poland for Poles, America for white Americans, etc. We know different examples of fascists all over the history, right? So this guy started this incredible and very fast spreading policy, Jews do not belong. Ukrainians do not belong, Poles do. And that became a nightmare for every Polish Jew living in the country. If before, during the Russian era, the Polish language was forbidden, now being Jewish meant being rate number three or four or down below. And this is, this is a huge slap on the face. And even in this era, politically, very difficult and very challenging, Korczyk managed to keep the orphanage up and to let children live their lives as best as he could. So, uh, yes, um, of course. Did he go by Korczak? Korczak, yeah. Um, even during the All the time, time. He was yeah, all the time, yeah, all the time. In fact, uh, it's good you asked. There was a radio show and it was called Old Doctor Radio Show. He was the one. He was a radio man, a showman on the radio, weekly, for many years. And the radio director was kind of, let's not give the name, let's keep it Old Doctor. Like, no one really knew that was a Jewish person. In 1930s, it became kind of survival thing. Let's not say that's a Jewish doctor whom all the Poles will send letters and ask for advice. That was a Pole. But it came to the point when the director of the radio station had to bring him in and say, I'm sorry, we have to stop. Why? Well, you know. Why? Well, you know. You're Jewish. So what? You are Jewish. And like, you know, it's like my mom would hear as a pediatrician in the Soviet days, you're a really good doctor in spite of being Jewish. That was like, yeah, you're great as a radio showman, but you know, enough is enough. We cannot go on with that. So, at that time, many of uh, Korczak's uh, graduates would immigrate to Palestine. And that was the time when Palestine started as a nation. There were many things around it. I'm not going into history. I'm sure some of, some of you know there were lots of difficulties in this way. And many of them would write to Korczak and say, come, live with us in kibbutz. Do you know the concept of he refused it? So there were two. But the major one which we're talking is about, about is the one for Jewish children. So the war started in September 1939. And Poland was immediately, in one day, occupied by the Nazi Germany. If you know from history, it was a, 
an agreement between the Soviet Union, between Stalin and Hitler, they practically agreed that they would give up Poland, but that would allow the Soviet Union not to get into the war per se. But the fascist Germany still broke up this agreement two years later, and uh, the Second World War for Russia started on June 22, 1941. But those two years when Poland was literally given to Hitler, in return, Russia received those two years. But Poland was absolutely betrayed. Poland under Hitler is a totally different story. The population of Poland was at some point one-third were Jewish. Then it was less, but still there was a big Jewish population in Poland. And at the very beginning, the plan which Hitler announced was kind of using Jews for work. Like having labor camps and using Jews as like third power just to work for the Nazis. And then he realized too many, too many Jews. Let's eliminate them physically. Let's clean the earth from Jews. This policy came later, and because of that, not immediately the ghetto were constructed in different places, but a little later during the Polish war. So the Warsaw Ghetto per se was created in 1940, and only later in the year, in 1940, the orphanage, which was completely Jewish orphanage, was moved into the ghetto. So this is the map of the ghetto, the way it was developed. And as you see, this kind of greenish yellowish, uh, that is the ghetto. But in between, you see those small spots? Because there were so many Jews and they lived all over in Warsaw, it was very difficult to have something which would be absolutely Jewish. So those small spots could be church, a Christian church or a Catholic church mostly. Yeah, so different places which were not the ghetto. And there were electric trains or trams which would go from one area in the ghetto through the Aryan area and then back into the ghetto. And there would be no stop for Jews like, you know, so if, if you can imagine, you are in the cage. You are allowed out of the cage, but only to get into another cage. And you are passing by, and you kind of see a different life, like normal. But for a very short period of time, and then you are back in the cage, and the door is locked, and you are inside and you feel like a mouse trapped. But when there are so many people, and most of them were really educated people, so there was life in the Wasser ghetto. There were theater productions, believe me or not. There were schools which were kind of illegal under, you know, the tablecloth, but they were functioning. There were universities which were functioning in the ghetto. There were doctors who were providing uh, services. Everything was functioning because if you think of the human nature, you would understand, like, people can live and work under any circumstances. You make it harder, we resist. You make it even harder, we still resist because that's the nature, and that's what was happening. And besides, of course, Jews have a huge history of survival. But not this time. Most of the Warsaw Ghetto was killed, this way or another way. And by 1943, after the uprising of the ghetto, most people, they say 97%, of course, when it's such a huge territory, there were places like underneath where children could go through. 
and Korchuk would actually let children go or bring something inside, children became the providers. Where the adult could not, children could, because they were smaller physically, or they knew different ways. And for children, when they were in the Aryan side, it was easier to hide. Many children were smuggled out of the ghetto, and they survived. The way they were trying to smuggle children were mostly the children who did not look Jewish, like if they had light uh, hair, if they had light eyes, you know, not uh, hazel eyes, not black hair. Uh, it was easier. Many actually Catholics would save children, give them different names. We will have an incredible presentation about this uh, next week. Uh, there would be Tila Mazel, who is a writer. Uh, I think she's presenting on Tuesday for us. She wrote a book about Irena Sendler or Irena Sendler Rover. Uh, Irena Sendler smuggled, together with the people she organized, uh, 2,500 Jewish children out of the Warsaw Ghetto. It's pretty incredible. She was a tiny woman under 150 centimeters. And this tiny woman, with incredible perseverance and commitment, not only smuggled all those kids, but she kept the list of all the names, so the real name and the name given. And many of them, after the war, who survived, they actually learned their real names. Because when the child is small and the child is small, all you need for this child to remember a new name that he or she is a Catholic and forget about your Jewishness, right? But after that, children tend to forget. And some children, can, especially when they were little, they would consider their Catholic parents their parents. But if somebody from the family survived, of course they wanted to find that child. And only because of her list, which she managed to do, uh, the children found their families and their relatives. So we will have this presentation. The person here on the right, um, that's a very controversial figure. I, I want to explain it. When Jews uh, were put into ghettos, Nazis needed some Jewish leadership within the ghetto. Not because they respected Jews, but because they knew the Jewish leadership would be easier and better for Jews to understand what was happening. So in every ghetto, there was a Jewish leader, there was Jewish police, and there were many collaborators. But collaborators per se, because they were all finally killed sooner or later. They were just middle wives between the victims and the Nazis first. And then when the cage became too tight, they were also killed. So Chernikov was one of them. He was the head of the Warsaw Ghetto. And when it came to 1942, and he received all the orders that everyone in the ghetto is going east, and Nazis were saying, we're relocating. He knew better than anyone that relocation was death. So he committed a suicide because he, he understood there's no way. He tried to help and, and uh, save the children, but there was no way. So <clears throat> the last days and uh, um, how should I put it? Korchuk, Korchuk was a very wise person. He knew from day one in the ghetto, he knew the end is coming and it would be the end. But as with medical doctors, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. When you know the children, th this child is going to die because you can't treat this child, right? Because medical science today doesn't know how. You still do your best and you still try to let this child live to the very end, a full life, right? 
So that's how Korchak felt. In 1939, he was what he called an old man, 60. Crazy, yeah, sounds like old man. Yeah, and uh, he knew the end would be such, death. But at the same time, he also knew these children, some of them would live only 10 years old, some would live only 12 or 14 or 7. But he wanted them to live. At the same time, he wanted them to be prepared to that last journey. So in July 1942, he did what he would uh, do on a common... uh, what he would do on a regular basis, a theater performance. In July 1942, July 18th, if if you think of this, July 18th and then August 5th, when they were all deported to Treblinka, 17 days apart. Did he know? Of course he did. Was he sure that's the only way and there's no way to rescue them? Of course he did. And they had a performance, a performance by Rabindranath Tagore, post office. I actually never knew until recently why the Indian writer, is the name known to you, Rabindranath Tagore? Not really. So Rabindranath Tagore was a great philosopher and humanist and educator and writer. And he wrote a number of poems and also um, plays. And they lived practically at the same time. And he was part of the Polish curriculum, which I didn't know. So for every Pole and every Polish teacher, Tagore would be a very um, common name, would be known. They would be familiar with what he did. So Korchuk chose a play which is called Post Office. And in this play, the main character is dying. And the whole performance is about this little boy, not so little, he is 10. And this uh, Amal, the boy, the main character, is dying. And there are different characters, different children who meet with him. And there's a king and just all different, uh, I, I wouldn't give you the whole plot, yeah? But what was it? It was to prepare children for that angel of death coming for them. But what is striking for me July 18th, they sent out invitation letters to people in the ghetto. And the whole big room, the largest, was full of people. And there was applause, there were words of congratulations and bravo. And just think of this. People are almost at their door, a death step, yeah? Just next, next day or a few days. But they still live their full lives. And Korchak, why do we know this? Because Korchak is writing about it in his diary. What is interesting, his secretary, who was Polish, Igor Niverli, uh, that's a famous figure, and he published a lot afterwards. He survived. And uh, Korchuk, refusing to be rescued from the ghetto, told Niverli that, if anything, I want you to save my diary, because this is a document which I want people to know. So the, the diary was actually kept and uh, published afterwards. What really struck me when I read it for the first time The last note is a few days before August 5th. And he is writing, very short notes, and uh, and he is writing, I'm looking at the soldier who is standing in front of our home. So they, they had the guards for no one to escape. I'm looking at that soldier. I'm watering the flowers or the orphanage. My bald head is a great target for him to shoot. And then the next phrase, why is he not 
doing it. And then the next, maybe he was a teacher in his previous life. Maybe he was cleaning streets. Maybe he doesn't know what is happening. Just think of this. A person who went through three years of war, who saw more lives gone, more than many, many others, he's still trying to find an excuse for a Nazi soldier standing next to the orphanage. Why? Maybe he doesn't know what is happening. That was really striking for me because how can you keep this kind of humanity facing all the evil, pure evil, which is happening in front of you, right? This is something which only a person with a huge heart can do. Because when you live through all these circumstances, you would think your heart would harden really much. And you would not look for excuses for Hitler soldiers. But he still tried. The, there's a great movie called, I, I would recommend, um, you can find it on YouTube. It's called Korchak. And Korchak is a movie which was done by a Polish director, Andrzej Wajda, in 1990. It's kind of, it's the iconic, it's the major movie about Korchak. And the movie ends up with an interesting scene there's this train where the children with Korchak are, and all of a sudden, the train stops, and this particular car in which the children are kind of given free way, and this car is in a beautiful field, and the door opens, and the children are out, and Korchak is with them, and there's a rainbow, and the sun, and the sky, and there leaving and it feels like they escaped. None, none escaped, none. But there was a lot of criticism coming from the people who survived the ghetto, like saying, Vida did not do it well. Vida actually diminished their whole life story of courtship. I actually think it's a great ending of the movie, showing there's still hope there's still hope because, as we said today, lives of children could be very short, but he managed to make them happy as much as he could, right? So there's hope in this world if such people lived and the story of them and the real story of their lives is preserved. But this whole metaphor of children living with the sun and the rain about, and it's just really beautiful. So if you ever have a chance, just watch the movie. In some parts, it might be not exactly uh, historically correct, but it's, it's a great movie. So we can only think or decide for ourselves what Korchak was thinking about when all of that was happening. A lot. And just thinking back, whether he betrayed the children, maybe he could rescue them, which was never a chance, or did he do everything he could? Maybe not. If we put ourselves, those who are parents, into the shoes of a parent of 192 children, and you know they're dying tomorrow, it doesn't matter that you die with them, it's just they're dying. So it's, it's in a way a very tragic story, but at the same time it's such an incredible symbol of humanity.